This is the seventh session on true religion. Usually, all themes end with the seventh session. There must be some end somewhere, isn't it? We'll see. Now, today, um, I would like to propose that true religion is not about owning a God or God belonging to us, but our belonging to God. Now, you have to be very careful, very attentive, because one of the problems when we discuss religious and uh, philosophical matters is that two contrary statements will actually look alike. Because the distinction is very subtle. Now, what is the difference between God belonging to us and our belonging to God? Two expressions, very simple, which we need to fix very clearly in our minds at the outset so that we can think clearly and come to some understanding of this much misunderstood and horribly misused concept. And this is something that every educated person should be clear about. What are the two things? God belonging to us or I'm going to put it more simply, my God. Right? Then, our belonging to God. Being a child of God. Two things, they look similar, but they're exact opposites. And this is what we are trying to understand. And unless you are very attentive and cooperative, I will not be able to succeed in this. So now, let's be, let me take up the first part, the first possibility. God belongs to me, my God. Now this is the present condition. Every religious community claims to have its own specialized God or gods which they and they alone possess. Like saying, this is my book. This is my coat. In this process, God is degraded, downgraded, brought down to the level of an item of ownership. My God. Now, when you see God in that light, you are perfect, or you feel that you are perfectly right and legitimate in attributing to God your partial sentiments, interests, and affinities. My God must be like me. It's as simple as that. If I hate X, my God might, must also hate X. If I favor Y, my God is obliged to favor Y. My God is duty bound to do everything the way I want him to. My God is not free to think differently from me. My God must tolerate all my nonsense, but must not tolerate anybody else's nonsense. This is how crude it is. So, God becomes an object pliable in my hands 
that I can shape and mold the way I want. I can be whimsical, capricious, inconsistent, inhuman. But because God is my God, He must support me in all this, aid and abet all my activities, and in fact, prove that whatever I am doing is right. This is how it is. Now, this is the reason why unspeakable abominations and unlimited cruelties have been perpetrated in the history of religions throughout human history. The amount of blood that has been shed in the name of God. The hate and the spite that is perpetrated and propagated in the name of God. The inhumanities that are showcased in the name of God. Now, people really don't feel the scandalous, shocking nature of this arrangement because all over the world, people have fallen into this trap. The trap of believing that God the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the ruler of the cosmos, is my little toy that I can handle at my will. And I don't think there is any greater irreligion than this. I don't think there is a greater insult possible to the majesty of God than believing that God is an object that my small little will can control at will. And yet, this is done routinely all the time. The second part of this problem is that when I believe that God is my God, my uh, uh, object of ownership, then I become the defender of my God. I become a policeman, a bodyguard, a TSO, personal security officer for my God. And if anyone says anything about my God, I will take the sword. And, and then I become the most religious man in the world. I can you imagine anything more stupid than this. I mean, just think for a moment. A God who needs me to protect him is a pathetic thing. I cannot protect myself. And I pretend that I can protect the Almighty God. Now, if there is a modicum of common sense in human beings, the intellectual poverty of it, the utter dishonesty of it, stands so clear and naked. Why is it that we can understand these things? And yet these things are stated in public as though this is the ultimate reach of spirituality. And there are millions to support it. God is not your toy. Get it right. God is not a tool in your hands for you to use as you want. Now we come to the second part which is God does not belong to me, I belong to God. Now if I belong to God, first, I have a duty to understand God. Because belonging is impossible without understanding. You really cannot belong to a person you don't understand. And you cannot but understand the person you belong to. You can't say, well, you know, I, I, he is my best friend, but he's, my, he's a total stranger to me. Can you do that? But that's what is happening all the time. So first of all, you have a duty, I have a duty to understand God. But that is the greatest problem. How do we understand God? Now this concept of God, the concept of the divine, has been so horribly misinterpreted, distorted, misrepresented, that today we find it difficult to move an inch forward. So the very first thing we have to do is to clean up our mind and to make a new start, a fresh start. Cast away all ideas you have so far received about God. 
keep your minds and hearts open to the eternal light. It's always there. If there is a God, and if that is God, and not some fiction, that God cannot be partial to a philosopher or a theologian as against you. You have the same rights and the same ability to understand God as a philosopher has. In fact, a philosopher is disqualified from understanding God. The reason is, the philosopher lives within the cobwebs of his rationality that he has spun. A philosopher cannot move to the left or right of that cobweb. And this is the reason why, for example, Gandhiji says in the opening pages of the story of my experiments with truth, he says that spirituality is something that children can understand. And in that, of course, he is simply echoing what Jesus of Nazareth said, that God has withheld these profound things from the philosophers of the world and has revealed them to the children of the world. Then he says, unless and until you turn back and become like children, you shall in no way enter the kingdom of God. So we don't need, we don't need all these great philosophers and thinkers to understand God. All we have to do is to remain open and <clears throat> the second step, we have to seek. Now, what we do all the time is, especially in our religious life, we simply lap up. We simply consume. We accept uncritically whatever other people say. We have been told from our time of birth, God is like this. This is the only God. We have never questioned any of these things. So, when God ceases to be my God and I become a child of God, I begin to seek. I experience an imperious need to know this God. What exactly does it mean to belong to this God? Now, this implies, or this certainly precipitates another pro uh, responsibility, which is the duty to be responsibly skeptical. So people don't understand that skepticism is an aspect of spirituality. The religions will persecute skepticism as heresy. Religions have done it. All through history they have done it. But when it comes to knowing God, skepticism becomes an important, not just any kind of skepticism, responsible skepticism. Why is skepticism important? Because we have inherited a lot of useless baggage from the past. Things that are totally scandalous about the nature of God, about the way we relate to God, about what it means to be a child of God. A great deal of useless, almost pathetically uh, 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 distorted baggage has been inherited from the past. And unless and until we shake ourselves free from this baggage, we will not be able to seek God. Now, if you look through a pair of iron spectacles, I'm using an image from, from a philosopher, really, Hegel. If you look through a pair of iron spectacles, what do you see? You see nothing. I mean, you have a spectacle, a pair of spectacles, all right. But, instead of glasses, you have iron, iron plates. So you see, and this is exactly what is happening. So, rather than claim that this God is my God, now, whenever war breaks out, for example, you will invariably see God being invoked. Each part, each of the two parties will claim God, God's protection. We expect partisan partic participation on the part of God in times of crisis. But we never, before we get into the war situation, we never ask the question, is it the will of God that we should fight at all? Never do that. 
But we do whatever we want, and when the consequences begin to hurt us, we say, God, take care of it. So, God is not our small little object of possession. He is a reality, an entity, a possibility that we today do not understand completely, but we are duty bound to seek. Now, to seek is to keep an open mind. You cannot seek with a closed mind. It's a contradiction in terms. Now the question of course is, why should you seek God? There must be some reason for it. This cannot be a purely intellectual matter. It has to be an existing thing. From my point of view, there is only one reason why we should seek God. And that is, need to grow out of this small city self, the ego, and attain the fullness of my stature. The only force that I have known in my life that encourages me, in fact, and joins upon me to grow out of my narrow little self, to become aware of this wonderful world in which we are, with all the responsibilities and possibilities of that, of that it contains, is God. Now, when you reject God, what happens is, your life gets shrunk, and your personality dwindles, and you become that small little creature, without any responsibility, without any larger awareness. If you look at the life of our contemporaries today, one of the important features, and that's a contradiction because we're living in an age of information, is a century of knowledge, but people know nothing. There is no knowledge at all. There is no awareness. How many of you, for example, are aware of the problems of our country? How many of you are aware of the realities in the city in which you live? How many of you are aware of the realities in the house in which you are living? How many of you are aware of the realities in the college to which you are proud to belong? If these questions are asked, the outcome will be very humiliating. Very often we reject the responsibility to know what is right in front of us. And I believe that this is atheism. Atheism is not saying that there is no God. Or atheism is not only saying that there is no God. There are a thousand forms and phases to atheism. And one of the primitive phases of atheism is indifference. If you are a child of God, you cannot afford to be indifferent. Indifference breeds ignorance. Ignorance makes you irrelevant. Irrelevance activates a sense of low self-worth. And you begin actually to despise yourself. The kind of opportunities that come our way are really exciting. But these opportunities walk past us because we are not ready to respond to them. And why are we not ready to respond to them? Because we live completely confined within our narrow shell called the self. And the function of the divine or the function of the awareness of the divine is to break the shell so that we are liberated from this narrow little world and we are able to grow. Now, let me close by saying this. There are two ways of life, or two models of life, and therefore two different kinds of personalities. One is a person who lives like the pig. You know, the pig goes uh, looking for food all the time. It looks for something that is purely related to itself. It is not concerned about anyone else. And therefore, this very strategy of life makes that animal an object of aversion. Why, why is the pig deemed the most despised among animals? Not really because it is dirty. There are other animals that are dirty. 
It's because I believe that all the time, when you look at a pig all the time, it is going uh, ar around digging its nose in the mud. It's completely limited to its own interest. And I believe that a human being who believes, uh, uh, lives like that, and many human beings are living like that, in fact the majority of people are living like that, are no better than pigs. This is my conviction. I think, the, I think the greatest self-condemnation we can invite upon ourselves is to live like this. A more decent expression for this is leading a hand-to-mouth existence. This is pathetic. This is not what we are meant for. The other kind of life is a life of larger awareness. Awareness that makes you realize that you are not just an isolated atom of mortality, but part of a wonderful, incomprehensible, mysterious, great scheme of things. And within that scheme of things, you have your designated role and you are extremely important. You're valuable, you're indispensable, and your life is relevant. And in order to discover your true relevance, you have to grow day by day. In the first model, there is no need to grow. You merely exist. In the second model, the greatest spiritual duty is to grow. Grow in your awareness. Go towards the realization that you are part of this cosmic scheme of things. It is so beautiful, it is so inexhaustibly mysterious. So, human consciousness becomes an ever-expanding ripple that embraces larger and larger zones of awareness. And therefore, the life of a person who actually believes in God is a life of increasing responsibility. Now, unfortunately, people are running away from responsibilities. And so that's a great service one does to oneself. In fact, it's because we are running away from responsibilities that we fail to grow at all. There is only one way you can grow, my friends. And that is by responding to responsibility. We are placed in a wonderful scheme of things. It is custom made to facilitate our growth in stature. And paradoxically, we are mandated to seek perfection. And in order to enable us to seek perfection, we are placed in an imperfect world. I hope you understood. I'm going to say that again. On the one hand, as human beings, it is basic to our being to long for, to thirst after, to seek perfection. Every human being experiences that thirst deep down, the thirst towards perfection. Now, because we are, we are doing nothing about it, we indulge in hero worship. The people we worship or people we look up to are people who have moved in that direction. We are too lazy to move in that direction. Therefore, what we do is, this is called vicarious pleasure. That is, deriving some pleasure through somebody else, the kind of pleasure that we should have experienced experience and, and gained for ourselves. We should have been like that. We are not like that. And therefore, the easiest thing to do is to... to Identify ourselves with that person. He's my hero. Okay? Fan club. See, so and so, the cine star has a fan club of uh, uh, five million people. Now, who are these people? People who are doing nothing. If you are growing, if you're doing your best, you will be nobody's fan. So, seeking perfection is basic to our identity as human beings. But, that's a paradox, and that's the greatness. This thirst for perfection, which is embedded in the human, is placed in a context of imperfection. And imperfection is the medium through which human perfection is to be sought. If the world in which we are living is perfect, 
Our being perfect would not have been important. You could have you know, forgotten about it. Then perfection would have been a realized state, and nobody would have to go after it. We are living in a frightfully imperfect world. Do not expect perf a, a perfect scheme of things. This is the mistake many people commit, and this is the reason why many people are always grumbling. They're, they're finding fault with everything, not realizing that fault or faults are to be expected. We are situated in an imperfect system. You will never find throughout your life, even if you live a hundred uh, births, you will never find a perfect system. But what is possible is, within this imperfect system, you can seek perfection. Therefore, and I'm going to close, the spiritual duty, please remember these words, the spiritual duty we have is to respond perfectly to an imperfect world. Is that clear? What is the essence of spirituality? What is true religion? What is true religion? True religion is the ability, or true religion is what trains us or inculcates in us the ability to respond perfectly to an imperfect world. Can you say this after me? To respond perfectly to an imperfect world. Now can you say that again? And I'll say that again. To respond perfectly to an imperfect world. Did you say that? Oh, there's no conviction in this. You know, this is the heart of the matter. I want you to be excited. All right? Say it again, loud. Let's bring the roof down. All right? So what is true religion? The roof is still standing there. You have not brought it down. Once again. What is it? Ah, that's somewhat. That's almost there. Is that all right, Professor William? It's acceptable to you? Then it is acceptable to me. Okay, that's right.